Today on Uncommon Knowledge, Shelby Steele, a fellow at the Hoover Institution and the author most recently of A Bound Man, Why We Are Excited About Obama and Why He Can't Win. Let's take the first subject in that subtitle first. Why are we excited about Barack Obama? Barack Obama is what I call a bargainer. He uh, makes us a certain deal with white America and, and he, prom he says, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to bet on your better side that you are not a racist and I will not constantly rub America's racial history in your face if you will not hold my race against me. And this is, an, um, uh, whites are very excited about this, this kind of an offer. It, it, uh, because he's, it, it gives them an opportunity to feel that that in a sense they, they are at least as within themselves redeemed of this, this past. And so they respond in great gratitude uh, with, with even affection. Uh, Oprah Winfrey is another example of a, of a great bargainer. So the, the special charisma that, that uh, Obama, that surrounds him, sort of rock star status, I think comes, um, he's, aside from his talent, and he is a, he is a very talented uh, politician, but much beyond that, I think, is this, this bargain, this, this capacity to make people feel affection. He's for intelligent, him. he's articulate, he's a graduate of Harvard Law School, where he edited the Law Review. We put that to one side. He has a set of particular policies. As best I can make it out, frankly, they're fairly conventional liberal democratic policies, at least at this point in the campaign. We put that to one side. We're excited about Barack Obama because he's black. And before anything else happens, he makes us feel good that we live in a country in which a black man can make mount a serious bid for president. Right. Okay, There's now, a, well, go, ahead. go ahead, no, no, no. There's a, the paradox of, of uh, Barack Obama is that he has a, a campaign that pretends or, or wants to transcend race. That's part of what, that's what makes him attractive. So paradoxically, his campaign is all about race. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his special appeal is all about race and, and very little else. Black candidates for president, 1972, Shirley Chisholm, Congresswoman, 1984, Jesse Jackson, 1996, Alan Keyes, runs as a Republican. And it could be argued that although he never officially announced for a period of a couple of months, Colin Powell was so co seriously considering running for president that he was in effect a candidate for a period of months in 1996, 2004, Al Sharpton. So that's going back th more than 30 years, half a dozen African-American candidates for president. What's distinctive about Barack Obama? He's the first one that, that is a bargainer, that brings this, this is an old mask in black American life. It's been there for certainly all the way back to slavery. In recent times, we've, Louis Armstrong was a bargainer. Sidney Poitier was a bargainer. Bill Cosby were, were bargainers. They made this, this deal. I will. I will uh, not, not bother you with race. I will, res I will presume that you are not racist, that you're better than that uh, is, if you won't hold my race against me. It's one of the ways whites and blacks developed over our long history in, in terms of relating to each other. And, uh, uh, but it has never, it's never been really used in politics before. This is the first time. We'll, we'll see how it works, but it certainly has already done what it always does. It, it brings a special charisma and aura and affection. People, uh, our, our feelings toward, toward bargainers are very warm and supportive. All right. Um, push back in the, against Barack Obama. Let me quote to you Christopher Hitchens, journalist Christopher Hitchens. <clears throat> this is a longish quotation, but Christopher covers a lot of ground here. Quote, Senator Barack Obama sometimes claims credit on behalf of all Americans regardless of race though his recent speeches appear also to c claim a victory for blackness. Isn't there something pathetic and embarrassing about this emphasis on shade? And why is a, black, is a man with a white mother considered to be black anyway? The more that people claim Obama's mere identity is a breakthrough, the more they demonstrate that they have failed to emancipate themselves." Close quote. Christopher comes out swinging. Larger point in a moment, first that more definite point. White mother, black father, but we all talk about him instinctive without giving it a moment's thought, as if he's a black man. Isn't that mm -hmm. in some way a ratification of that odious one-drop rule 
that goes all the way back to slavery one drop of black blood and you're a slave rather than a free man right. so uh, right it's like so many things with race it's it's uh, it, it's not rational um, the one drop rule if Barack Obama were walking down the street and and you did not know his mother was white you would hold him accountable as a black man and so the the down on the ground the the everyday life he's lived he's had he's lived with that accountability uh, no one would say, well, he's light-skinned, so he, he, I don't really know what his race was. People would say, there are a lot of light-skinned blacks, but they're blacks. So on the one hand, he, he uh, I've, this has been my own experience, and, and uh, so you, you are, uh, unless you announce somehow what the, the background is, you're going, to be, you're going to be held accountable to that. So he's a black man. It's right and just for him, him to call himself a black man. You write about him as a black man because that's the life that society thrusts upon him. He can't go yes. through, but um, uh, I just, there's it's a counterexample. It's a complicated, it, as, as Ralph Ellison would say, it's a complex fate. Okay. Uh, to, to because there are other parts to him. Ward Connerly, for example, who's a friend of yours, and uh, the great crusade against affirmative action, uh, state-imposed mandates for affirmative action, uh, I've interviewed him, and I started to ask him about his experience as an African-American, and he cut me off as he does everyone who starts to call him a black man or an African-American and says, no, I have part Cherokee, part this, part that. So he has decided to go through life asserting himself against the one drop rule. I guess Good I'm... For him. Uh, I, okay, I, I well, so it. you see, I'm, I'm asking I you I how... Applaud, I applaud that. Uh, I talk, Obama talks about a girl that he met in college who, was, uh, who, who uh, did a, took a similar stance. Don't call me African-American. My father's Italian. My mother's French and African. Um, so you're going to exclude all those other things and I'm just going to just going to be limited to an African. So, so I, I support that, and I, I, I'm happy when, when, when Ward does that. Um, and I make my own background known, and, and, and always have in, um, in, in my writing. Doesn't do much good. <laughs> but uh, but I, the point does need to be made. The point does need to be made. All right. So Christopher Hitchens' larger point. Forty years ago, Barack Obama couldn't have been a serious candidate for president because of the color of his skin. Today, he's a serious candidate for president because, because of the color, of the color of, of his skin. skin. Ex ex the exactly. color of his skin and not the content of his character, or that's at right. least the content of his character is something that's second or third on the list. Is that not right? Absolutely right. And so are we to be pleased by This is progress of a kind, I guess, but isn't Christopher no, right no. that there's still something? Just, to... Christopher's absolutely right in a sense, and, and I, I talk about this in the, in the, in the book. Barama is the result of a very old paradigm, bargaining, where you, you come almost hat in hand and you have to give whites the benefit of the doubt. He's, not, he's, not, he's seen as something new or talked about as something new, but he's something very old. Uh, he's been there before. He's, he's very similar to Louis Armstrong had to make that kind of a bargain. Uh, you would expect somebody at this point in, in our history, mm -hmm. as much as we've been through, to be fresher than that, to be able to run as an individual. Uh, without regard to whether you flatter whites or whether you flatter blacks or whether you anger them. Run as an individual on the basis of your own convictions, your own personal deep beliefs that you've evolved over a lifetime. Make a politics of that. Uh, Obama is absolutely, like all bargainers, the one rule they have is ne they never tell you who they really are. They never, never tell you what they really think, what their real convictions are. They nurture a kind of invisibility. And I can't think of a more invisible man than, than Barack Obama at this point. No one really knows who he is. Mm -hmm. It may be that he's not that clear about who he is himself. He's, he has the, a stunning facility with language. He writes like a novelist. He speaks beautifully. But he has no voice of his own. Mm -hmm. One of the chapters in A Bound Man, which I want to hold up to the camera again because it's such a splendid book, is entitled Becoming an Authentic Black. I'll quote you. The arc of Barack Obama's life is something of a zigzag between his passion to be black and the siren call of the extraordinary opportunities in the American mainstream where the racial identity he longs for matters little. Blackness does not tempt him away from the mainstream. Rather, the mainstream tempts him away from blackness. Close quote. Now, as you will have noticed by now, you're talking to a white guy. You've got to explain to me, why does Barack Obama feel a passion to be black in the first place? 
I think in, in his case, his case is a little different than mine. He was abandoned by his African father at the age of two. So in one, uh, in one stroke, he lost both a father and a racial identity. Mm -hmm. So here in this, in this all-white household is this little kid who is being held accountable in the world as a black, being raised by a mother who's white, a grandmother who's white, a grandfather who, who is white, uh, almost no experience whatsoever with, with other blacks. Um, and so, as I talk about in the book, as there's a longing to know the father in, in Barack Obama, there's also a, a longing to, to know himself as a black, to feel that he belongs, that simple sense that, that other blacks take for granted that, of course, where it's not a question at all. For him, is, is a lifelong um, angst. Um, and so he's driven in that direction and, and, you know, ends up on the south side of Chicago doing community organi organi organizing when he clearly could have gone straight ahead to law it's school after, and so forth. I, I, I'm trying to remember the career pattern. He graduates from Harvard Law School and then goes back to the, or have he I got that backwards? Well, he, he graduates from Columbia, then goes right. three years okay. in the uh, community organizing. In any event, organizing. from Columbia, he could have gone to Wall Street if he'd wanted to. He could have to. gone uh, and did for a brief moment mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and uh, quits, can't take it, wants to... This this call is there, this need, and so he takes this job at uh, at uh, below minimum wage uh, uh, as a community organizer and on the south side of Chicago. Okay, now as we have this conversation, and and as I read a bound man, I'm evaluating this man as a candidate. It's a fascinating story, merely as a matter of character study and what it says about the state of race in the United States. But he's running for president, so this notion of seeking out a black identity. The way it struck me was understandable and even commendable. Does it strike you the same way, or is it still too much race? He's doing something because of race. It's, how it how is, do you uh, understand it? How do you evaluate it? Well, I went through something of it myself. Uh, again, from that kind of a background, I, 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 I was lucky had my father, and so and I grew up in segregation, and that'll give you a clear sense of. <laughs> but you, you, of he, he was raised in a white in a white world. World, yes. but you were yeah. raised in a black in a, world. in an entirely black world. All right. right. So it was a. The, I didn't feel the pressure. I, I don't think in the way that he did, but I, it was there. I'm aware of it. Uh, there's this, there's a vulnerability that you have that other that people can say, as Christopher Hitchens says there, why is he really black? So some somebody who doesn't know you who uh, can walk up and and say, well, you're not really who you seem to be. Mm. you and, and uh, always along with that goes the suggestion that you're a phony, mm. that you're you're a bit of a fraud um, because of your birthright, your your fate. Uh, so it's a vulnerability, and uh, there was there's this desire to resolve it, mm. and that's I think Obama's uh, compulsion really to keep trying to find, to establish himself as an authentic uh, black. Okay, now you write failing about, all along. You you write. He, he goes to the Illinois State Legislature. He's now a member of the United States Senate for the last couple of years. He affiliates himself with a specifically black church in mm -hmm. Chicago called Trinity United Church of Christ. You write about it at some length. So incidentally does Christopher Hitchens, quote, Christopher now, run by the sort of minister that the press often guardedly describes as flamboyant. This bizarre outfit, the church, describes itself as, now he's quoting from their website, unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian and speaks of a chosen people whose nature we are allowed to assume is Afrocentric. Operative sentence, nobody who wants to be taken seriously can possibly be associated with such a substandard and shade-oriented place. Now, there's a point there. This is a graduate of Columbia and of Harvard Law School who's going to a place that it's reasonable to suppose is in one way or another intellectually beneath him, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So how do we say we, we cut him slack because he needs this? Like, how do you understand that one? Well, I, that, that's... That's one, of the, that's one of the, press, the, the questions I think the, the, the press, you know, he's been in this what I call white guilt bubble where they never ask him anything meaningful. How is it that you go to, a, to an Afrocentric uh, black nationalist church where everything is black, the morality black, community black, values black, um, a church that your mother would not be comfortable in if she would be welcome at all? How do you reconcile? Uh, something. Why don't you, could you stand up in this church and say it wasn't blackness that created Barack Obama. It was the Midwestern values of my mother. 
but that's how it got done. So maybe the people in this church might spend a little more time talking about those values than about blackness. I don't think Obama is, is, likely, uh, is likely to do that, but how does he resolve it? How does he reconcile? How do you, again, in this question of evaluating him as a candidate for the presidency, does this participation in a black church, you, you have nothing against religious belief. Christopher Hitchens does. Christ, religious right. belief right. per se makes him nervous, but right. I you, don't. you don't have that. But does this make you nervous going to this church because it's black? Do you say, oh, well, that's understandable. He has to. No, this is, and I, I talk about this a, a little bit. This is, this is something when, when you are born as, as he was, you endure this abandonment and, right. and it leaves these wounds and, right. and there is going to be, it's for, for anybody, a, 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 an attempt to sort of fill up that void in, in some way or another. The only way you can do it is through a thousand little self-betrayals where you go to that church and you turn a blind eye to the fact that it's, that it's beneath you intellectually that it is it is subscribes to an ideology that is, that would would exclude your own the loving family and parents that you had you betray yourself you get used to self betrayal as a survival mechanism as a way of getting through the world getting through society and that becomes the real that's where you pay the price because when you're doing that you're not developing a self mm -hmm. you're not individuating and uh, there is, there, there clearly is some of that with Obama, uh, this, this habit of self-betrayal. Let's the, the challengers and the bargainers. You describe this <clears throat> for sort of two templates in a bound man, to which every African American, between which every African American has to choose, challengers and bargainers. Now, maybe the quickest way to get to this is to describe the contrast between Louis Armstrong between two trumpeters, Louis Armstrong and Miles Davis, both of whom you write about beautifully. You know a lot about jazz music. There's no doubt about that. But give us Louis Armstrong and Miles Davis and explain what they say about the black experience in this country. Well, to, uh, what they have in common is, is and, and what all blacks have in common, uh, and it's a, an inevitable part, of, inevitable part of, of the minority experience, is masking. When you, are, when you don't have as much power as the, as the mainstream society, you have to learn to present yourself strategically so you can offset that power, power differential in some ways. Here's Louis Armstrong, uh, a musical genius who transformed the music not only of America but of the world. Mm. Uh, born poor black in, in um, Jim Crow, uh, New Orleans. Uh, as I say in the book, he, he, his talent was so big he couldn't just stay behind on the black side of, the, of apartheid. He had to come out in the main, into the mainstream. How do, how do you do that? You wear a mask. In his case, he, he took some things, some gestures from uh, minstrel shows. His, he'd make his, bug his eyes out. He'd smile relentlessly. He'd bow too much. And he'd, he'd show homage to whites. And he'd say, I'm going to entertain you, but I'm not going to presume to be your equal. And so I'm not going to call into question this whole Jim Crow thing, that this, your, your, your uh, involvement in this. this, this uh, you're going to be able to, to listen to me, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to entertain you, and, and you're going to go home feeling and, good. And, and he's a prototypical bargainer. The bargain is, you let bargainer. me play my music, and I won't upset and your, I won't, your I world. I won't bother you. I'm not going to become a protester. Um, and so people then, as always with bargainers, they love him for that deal. They love Louis Armstrong for that deal, uh, and it only made him more popular and more and more successful. Um, Miles Davis is the challenger. Miles Davis comes along after uh, the World War II. Uh, the military is integrated, schools are integrated, the world's changing. Whites begin to are beginning to to uh, to feel guilt about what has happened in the past, uh, and so Miles turns his back on his audience. No bowing, nothing, no no affect. Um, he, between sets, he curses them out, um, and and what he's but that too is a mask because in in, in a sense he's he's whites go to flock to see Miles Davis. We're happy to be insulted by him. Would would tell stories of it because again, I can be insulted by a black, me, which therefore indicates I'm not a racist. I'm above that national shame, right. and right. and so uh, it, it was a mask that worked. Uh, 
superbly for, for miles. All right. Now, you propose a thought experiment. I'm going to quote you <clears throat> and ask you to explain what you mean here. Again, we'll come back to Barack Obama in a moment, but the, the, you say things here that <clears throat> place him in context. Quote, suppose Oprah Winfrey suddenly presented a series of programs making the point that individual responsibility was the greatest power available to black America. Suppose she announced that racism, while still a nuisance, had receded to the point where individual responsibility could at last pay off. Suppose she said that we blacks, like free peoples everywhere, should be entirely responsible for our uplift, whether or not help or even fairness came from others. What would be the likely consequence for Oprah Winfrey, one of the great bargainers of all time, were she to go down this road? Uh, she would lose her, lose her iconic status overnight. Um, it, her, her career would, uh, she's an enormously talented woman, and so it'd certainly be something for her to do. But the Oprah that we know, this sort of almost uh, magical figure who can sell books and, and so forth, that would all be gone. Uh, that's, that's precisely what Bill Cos Cosby did. Um, Bill Cosby Bill Cos did it. He did it. He said what he really felt and broke the, the, the golden rule of bargainers, never say what you really think. He, he broke it, said it, lost his iconic status, no longer sells Jell-O, um, because now... So, so I, so I can understand, I follow the argument easily, it's intuitively graspable. Mm -hmm. Why, if she starts talking about individual responsibility, she will upset the Jesse Jacksons and the Al Sharptons of the world because they have, as you explain, a vested interest in white guilt, right? But ordinary... African Americans and ordinary white people. Well, why doesn't it, what? I, that's that's not as easy for me to grasp. If Oprah Winfrey says, "I think blacks uh, ought to be that personal responsibility is the greatest source of power we we have," meaning blacks should be more responsible right. for their own uplift. What white person is going to stand next to her then? Because the instant a white person stands next to her and, and sent, preaching, in a sense, to blacks and telling them that they need to be responsible for their own uplift, that white person is going to be seen as a racist. Right. Any black person who stands next to uh, her, if she were to say that, would be seen as a sellout, an Uncle Tom, giving away black, black, black power. So Bill Cosby, who did say that, walk, enters a kind of exile. Um, and and that is that is in it that when, that is the way it, it goes. We have not moved beyond that yet. For blacks who don't wear either one of these masks, bargainers or challengers, they enter a kind of a kind of exile, at least in a metaphorical sense. Mm -hmm. All right. This brings us the bound man. This brings us to the second assertion in your sub. A bound man. Why we are excited about Obama and why he can't win. Why he can't win. I'm going to quote you to yourself again. Barack Obama has to bargain. He has to give whites their innocence until they prove they are unworthy of it. This is what white Americans sense in Barack Obama. On pain of his personal integrity, he simply cannot be a challenger. Yet to be black, he has to exaggerate black victimization in America. Obama is today a bound man who cannot serve the aspirations of one race without betraying those of another. Explain that. Yes, that's right. If he, um, <clears throat> the black American identity is still for the most part grounded and challenging. You never give white people the benefit of the doubt. That's our power, is keeping them on the hook, keeping them in a, in a keeping ourselves entitled and them obligated. Uh, well, here is Barack Obama becoming a superstar precisely by giving whites the benefit of, of the of the doubt. He seems letting to Letting them off the hook. Letting them off the hook. He seems to be giving, you know, giving away the family jewels. He's, he is, he's, uh, he is un completely undermining black power, which is based on challenging and, and, and challenging whites and white guilt and so forth. So he is a profound threat on that, in that level, and that's why he's had so much difficulty um, garnering the black vote, getting, getting accepted in the black community. Um, on the other hand, if, if, if whites see him over here too much, uh, so talking about black victimization and, and, and putting on the mask of the challenger in order to get the black vote, they're going to say, we like you precisely because you don't challenge, because you are an anti-Al Sharpton. That's why we like you. And so then his, 
uh, his, his white support uh, begins to wane. So he's, he is caught there. And, um, and the only way out of that, I mean, the only, the only, his, his only solution to that is always the bargain of solution, become more and more invisible. In, but you have it's a specific more, meaning when you say invisible in that here. Explain that. You never reveal your, your inner self, your, your true character. Your individuality, your self, your, the, the, the convictions that you really have, what you really believe. You, in fact, you take them out of all of your, all of your calculations. Uh, and you put in only what is effective with this group or with that group. You become a shapeshifter. So this is a retreat from Dr. King's dream that people, Americans, would be judged on the content of their character, not the yes. color of their skin. Barack Obama is in a bind, the dynamic of which is to make him hide the content of his character more and more and more deeply. Is right. that correct? Absolutely. Um, you know, we all know who Hillary Clinton is. I mean, it's, she's, she's, there's no mystery there. She's a post-60s liberal, big, big government. Government is virtue, intervention. John, uh, John Edwards is a populist. Uh, who is Barack Obama? Good darn question. Uh, no, no one, no one. Uh, can no I one can I try something on you, Shelby? We've been talking about race, and um, maybe there is a way out. He Good. forget he forgets <laughs> about race, okay, and talks about economic growth. I know this is, a, mm -hmm. but but he but this is what Barack Obama said. If he were talking about e economic growth, he'd still be in the Illinois state legislature. Well, hang on. He said this. He said this. He said this just a few days ago to some editors in Reno, a Nevada, where he's campaigning for the, uh, in the Nevada primary. Quote, I'm quoting Barack Obama. I don't want to present myself as some sort of singular figure. I think Ronald Reagan changed the trajectory of America. This is breathtaking in some way that he compares himself to Ronald Reagan. He just mm -hmm. tapped into what people were already feeling, which was we want clarity, we want optimism, we want to return to the sense of dynamism and entrepreneurship that had been missing, close quote. And you remember uh, Pat Moynihan was, uh, wrote a memorandum, which is still famous, when he was serving as Richard Nixon's domestic policy advisor, in which he called for a period of benign neglect uh, of African Americans, which sounded insulting, but what he meant was stop talking about race, economic growth, everybody will be better off. Mm -hmm. Or is this, am I this, am I lunging at this little sliver of daylight, or is this, is this Barack Obama just shape shifting again? It's it's the the problem the problem with that is that race is what brought him to the dance, mm. not not economics, um, and so he is he is the entire phenomenon um, is is explained in, solely by race. I don't really know what his, and I don't think most people know what his economic uh, positions are on, on uh, much of anything. Closing quotation. This is very close to the end of a bound man. The challenge for Barack Obama is the same as it is for all free people to become an individual rather than a racial cipher. Close quote. Mm -hmm. Between now and November, can he do so? I, I can't. I can't imagine how he would how he would do it. No. Um, and that's why I don't think he'll win, because I think, I think you have to, in the end, give the American people concrete reasons uh, to vote for you. You have to tell us what you want to do with the country. That's why I don't, his, his, uh, his Reagan comparison is so, so off the wall for me. Reagan knew exactly what, he had these three things, he wanted them. That's, you vote for me, this right. is what you're going to get. I'll cut your taxes, yeah. I'll take on the Soviets, that's here's right. what I'll do. And, and that's the end of it. And so you can take that or you can leave that. What, what do I get with, with Barack Obama? What I get is that vote for me for what I represent rather than for who I am or what I will do. So in, in other words, he's asking the American people to put this enormous amount of power in his hands without ever telling us what he's going to do with it. And some black leaders sense that white people will say, great, we'll vote for this guy once and we'll never have to listen to talk about race again. That, and, 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 that, and, and listen, they're right. And, and, and they're, they're right. They're right. Are they and not? They, and and right? I may have underestimated that. Uh, he might win on that, uh, on that alone. I, it, I would be disappointed in the American people if he did. But, but uh, the, there is, the point is that there is a hunger out there in white America. The, the Barack Obama phenomenon is about white America. It's not about Barack Obama. There and is it's this, not about black America. And it's not about black America. There is this need, this, this, 
driving uh, hunger to somehow get this race thing resolved, to redeem the country, to get beyond it. And uh, the arc of Obama's political career has simply just come right into that hunger and that need, and that's, that's his, his phenomenon. All right. A few um, short answer questions. Okay. Barack Obama is in a bind as a black man. Hillary Clinton is in a bind as a woman. She has to demonstrate strength. She's asking people to make her chief executive, commander-in-chief, but she has to demonstrate some degree of femininity. As a political matter, whose bind is the greater drawback? Oh, B Ob Obama's by far. Not close. It's not, it's not, not close. even close. Um, you know, people may comment, comment about a, a tear or whatever ever from Hillary, but, but um, she's not, you know, pulled in completely opposite ideological directions. Um, uh, like Obama is. I mean, he's, he, he, and so, and, and we, as a result of that, we know her a lot better. Do you admire Barack Obama? You write with something yes. that comes very close to affection here. I, ha, I, I, I identify with him on some level. I, 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 he's, a, he's a person with enormous facility and talent. I think he's got, in terms of raw political talent, um, he's, he's the best there is. The, he, I, this he may, has be, no this may be too crude a question, but does he make you feel Proud as a black Absolutely. man yourself. Absolutely, he, he makes does. me feel proud. I, I say that everywhere I go. I feel proud of him, um, and I and his potential is enormous. I just wish he would uh, he'd go a little deeper. Uh, the California primary takes place on February fifth. For whom will Shelby Steele be voting? That's I, I honestly, truly do not know at this point. I, I can guarantee you it will be on the Republican side of the aisle. Oh, you will not cross the aisle to vote for Barack. I will Obama. not. I would never vote for Barack Obama because politically I have. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, much at odds with, with what I know of his, of his politics. Who will win the Democratic nomination? Well, if In you, other words, when you say yes. why he can't win, are you yes. saying, in a certain sense, this guy's in a psychological bind, psychologically he's damned if he does and he's damned if he doesn't, but I'm not making a political prediction. Or are you actually, do you mean this as a political prediction, I, I, he's out? Ultimately, it has to be. It has to come down to. A, I leave myself a couple back doors in there, but, but, but I, ultimately, it seems to me it's accountable to a. I cannot. I cannot see him winning. You can't. I cannot. Um, I, could you have I, seen I would Colin be, Powell winning? I would winning? be surprised. I could absolutely see Colin Powell. Colin Powell was much more visible as an individual. This was an American general. He had fought in two or three different wars. He has. He was wounded. He had. He had, you know, all sorts of, of achievements. His, his uh, loyalty, his understanding of, of foreign policy, of national security, all these things were off the table because they were so clear in his case. Um, I think in, in 96 against a, a weak Bill Clinton, I would have been surprised if he, hadn't, uh, if he hadn't won. So the advice to America is wait for another Colin Powell? Uh, the, the, the advice to, to America is, is to wait for an individual. Uh, if you have to vote for somebody because they're black, don't do it. That's don't a, do that's it. a, you're making things worse, not better. You're back in an old paradigm rather than in a new one. Uh, it should be self-evident that you, you're voting for somebody who's an individual who tells you who he is and, and ask you, and ask for your support. You can uh, take it or leave it. Shelby Steele, thank you very much. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. Shelby Steele is the author of A Bound Man, why we are excited about Obama and why he can't win. Thanks.